From a hobby project in 1991 to one of the most widely used operating systems in the world, the development of Linux is a remarkable story of collaboration, innovation, and open source software. Linux, for those that don't know, is a community of open source operating systems developed on top of the Linux kernel, the core of the operating system, responsible for managing resources, providing access to hardware, and communicating with other software. One could say it all started in 1991 when Linus Torvalds, a computer science student at the University of Helsinki, started working on the operating system as a hobby project. He was frustrated with the proprietary nature of existing operating systems and wanted to create a free and open source alternative that anyone could use and contribute to. A kernel that could be independent of any OS and be used on his hardware, the new Intel 8386 microprocessor. But it began 22 years earlier, with the invention and implementation of the Unix OS by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in 1969 after AT&T had dropped out of the Multix project. The first version was released in 1970, two years later rewriting Unix in a new programming language, C, to make it portable. Then, in 1983, Richard Stallman started the GNU project with the goal of creating a free Unix-like operating system and as a part of his work wrote the GNU GPL, both very important pieces for the future of Linux. And in 1987, Minix was developed by Andrew S. Tannenbaum as a teaching tool for computer science students. The operating system intended for academic use was small and simple, but restricted modification and redistribution, and wasn't powerful enough to serve as a full-fledged operating system for desktop computers. Because it had a 16-bit architecture that wasn't well adapted to Intel's increasingly popular 386 design for PCs, the microprocessor Linus was using at the time, Minix couldn't accomplish what Linus wanted it to do. So on August 25th, 1991, he posted a message to the comp.os.minix news group announcing his new project. He wrote, I'm doing a free operating system. Just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU for 386, 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. This message marked the beginning of the development of what we all know and love as Linux. A project that never would have existed according to Linus Torvalds himself if either the 386 BSD, which was thwarted by AT&T's lawsuit against BSD since AT&T owned the Unix copyrights, or GNU Heard, thwarted by the lack of development effort, was available at the time because he wouldn't have been interested in writing his own project. But luckily for us, he did. Torvalds started with a task switcher, an Intel 8386 assembly language, and a terminal driver. Then, as Torvalds wrote in his book, Just For Fun, which I linked in the description, he eventually ended up writing an operating system kernel, the Linux kernel, first made public on September 17th, 1991, where Torvalds released the 10,239 lines of source code for the operating system on the internet and invited other developers to contribute to the project. Over time, the Linux community grew and thousands of developers from around the world contributed code, bug fixes, and new features to the project. This approach to development, open source development, is one of the key factors that has contributed to the success of Linux. And at this point in the video, I'm sure a handful of people commented down below, it's not Linux, it's GNU Linux. It's a bit more nuanced than that. The Linux kernel, is just Linux. But what most people refer to as Linux today, the distributions, is GNU with Linux added, or GNU Linux. GNU played an incredibly important role in the development of Linux as we know it. As a matter of fact, in the Notes for Linux release 0.01, Torvalds lists the GNU software that is required to run Linux. Sadly, a kernel by itself gets you nowhere. To get a working system, you need a shell, compilers, a library, etc. These are separate parts and may be under a stricter or even looser copyright. Most of the tools used with Linux are GNU software and are under the GNU copy left. These tools aren't in the distribution. Ask me or GNU for more info. Although I do think a binary of GNU's bash shell actually was, just saying. In 1992, Torvalds suggested releasing the kernel under the GNU General Public License instead of its very own license it had been using, and did so that December. 
Linux and GNU developers work to integrate GNU components with Linux to make a fully functional and free operating system. Torvalds has stated, making Linux GPL'd, referring to the GNU GPL, was definitely the best thing I ever did. So while the designation Linux is initially used by Torvalds only for the Linux kernel, what most of us know as Linux today actually uses a combination of both GNU and Linux and would more appropriately be called GNU Linux which is what's preferred over what the creator of GNU, Richard Stallman, had initially called the combination Linux, spelled L-I-G-N-U-X, when he published the Emacs 19.31 editor in May of 1996. I think GNU Linux has a slightly nicer ring to it. The story behind the name Linux itself is actually an interesting one. It's obviously derived from the name of its creator, Linus Torvalds, and Unix. But before that, Linus wanted to call it Freaks. As in free, freak, because only a freak would use an operating system built by nobody, and X from Unix, which is the name he used for about half a year because he thought Linux was too egotistical. That is until the files were uploaded to the FTP server of Funet in September 1991, and Ari Limke of Helsinki University of Technology, a volunteer administrator for the FTP server at the time, named the project Linux on the server without consulting Torvalds, because he did not think Freaks was a good name. I'm inclined to agree with them on that one. Later, however, Torvalds eventually consented to Linux. Oh, and the penguin mascot, the one we all know and love. Its name is Tux, created by Larry Ewing in 1996 after Torvalds mentioned he was bitten by a little penguin on a visit to the National Zoo and Aquarium in Canberra, Australia, with the name deriving from Torvalds Unix, T-U-X, plus it being short for Tuxedo. Absolutely iconic. And finally, on Pi Day, nonetheless, March 14th, 1994, Linux kernel 1.0.0 was released. It had received contributions from nearly 12,000 programmers from more than 1,200 companies and consisted of 176,250 lines of code. Quite the increase from the original 10,239 completely free and completely open source, which seems normal for today, but to get a similar Unix operating system at the time, you'd be shelling out hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Throughout the years, a number of important Linux distributions were released that have had a significant impact on the growth and development of Linux. Some of the most important distributions include Red Hat, Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, and I gotta mention Arch. Red Hat was one of the first commercially successful Linux distributions and was released in 1994, designed to be a stable and reliable operating system for enterprise use and quickly gained a reputation for quality and reliability. Fedora, released in 2003, is a community-driven distribution that is designed to be a leading-edge platform for the development of new technology. Debian, another community-driven distribution, but released earlier in 1996, has a strong focus on software freedom and is widely used as a base for other distributions. Ubuntu, one of the most popular Linux distributions released in 2004, is designed to be easy to use and accessible to people of all skill levels. CentOS, released in 2004 as well, and also a community-driven distribution like many of these are, was designed to be a stable and reliable platform for enterprise use. And Arch, released in 2002, focuses on a user-centric approach and highly customizable system that's always up to date. It's inspired other distributions to adopt a rolling release model and focus on user control and customization. I also just wanted to tell you that I use Arch, by the way. I've made an entire video in the past about the best Linux distros, depending on what you need. In case you wanted to check that out, I'll link it in the description, as well as one about why Linux is better than Windows. Today, Linux is one of the most widely used operating systems in the world and is used by individuals, businesses, and governments alike. As of February 2023, its GitHub repository has roughly 30 million lines of code, 1.1 million commits, and almost 14,000 contributors. 
There are over 600 active Linux distributions. Linux runs on all of the top 500 fastest supercomputers, 85% of smartphones in the form of Android, 96.3% of the top 1 million web servers, 47% of professional developers use Linux-based or Unix-like operating systems. And as of 2017, I couldn't find anything more recent, about 90% of cloud infrastructure operates on Linux. SpaceX has used Linux supported systems to complete 65 missions so far, including the famous Falcon 9 missions, and about 90% of Hollywood special effects rely on Linux. This growth and adoption is due in part to the efforts of numerous communities, companies, and organizations that have worked to develop, refine, and support Linux, as well as its adherence to open source principles and the contributions of millions of users around the world. All started by one man who just wanted to get the most out of his 386 clone, but didn't have enough money to do so. You can truly see the impact that Linux and Linus have had on the world. It serves as another reminder, as with Alan Turing, that one person, one project can truly make a difference. I hope you enjoyed this video about the history and development of Linux. Making these videos about computer science history is quickly becoming a passion of mine with many more to come. So if you like this one, subscribe to the channel as I'm sure you'll like the next ones, like when we dive into the GNU project. Any and all recommendations for future videos are welcome in the comments. And until next time, y'all have a good one.